Uh, what are the laws of physics is going to be a uh, subject of the talk today. Uh, Paul Davies is no stranger to NIST. He's been here twice before to give uh, uh, invited talks like today. Uh, back in 1998, he spoke about the arrow of time. And uh, in the year 2000, he spoke about the fifth miracle, the search for the origin of life. Today, he's going to talk about what are the laws of physics. Uh, Paul Davies is a theoretical physicist, a cosmologist, an astrobiologist, a prolific author, and even a radio TV broadcaster, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in just a minute. He started out uh, getting his PhD at the uh, University College London in 1970 and was doing at the time atomic astrophysics. In particular, he was interested in, in uh, doing calculations of the dielectric recombination uh, in the solar corona. Uh, soon he, he, uh, his research migrated into other areas uh, nearby areas, cosmology, gravitation, quantum field theory, properties of black holes, in particular the thermodynamic properties and the quantum properties of curved fields, and then the origins of the universe in general. Uh, he uh, went to Australia and spent the better part of his career there. He uh, was the head uh, uh, a professor of mathematical physics and natural philosophy at the University of Adelaide, and uh, uh, went on after that to Macquarie University in, in Melbourne, I guess, Sydney, Sydney uh, where he was professor of natural philosophy. Uh, at uh, Macquarie, he helped found the Australian Center for Astrobiology. In just the last couple years, he's now come to the United States. Uh, he's at Arizona State University. That's where you'll find him now since 2006. He's the director of a new center there called the Center for Fundam Fundamental Concepts in Science. His research has taken him into the areas I've already mentioned, the cosmology, the gravitation, but also into the nature of time, uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics, and uh, also into chaos theory and the theory of complex systems. Uh, Paul Davis, Davies is known worldwide for his books. Uh, he's, uh, as I said, a prolific author, writer, and communicator. He's published over 100 research papers alone, uh, but also 27 books, uh, a selection of which, by the way, is outside here. I, I think we have uh, four of the 27 books that uh, you might want to have a look, look at. Uh, but not only that, he's published about 1,000 a, a a thousand articles for science magazines, and still another thousand newspaper articles. So uh, I know I've read three of his books, and the one thing I have to tell you about his books is I, I like the style, basically. He, he asks questions like always why, why does something work the way it does, and then he sort of answers the question. But whenever you answer a question, you know, that always uh, brings up the more questions of why, and that's the way he advances through his books. Why, 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 why? Always peeling back the onion until he finally gets down to something uh, very fundamental and uh, often mind-boggling. Uh, his latest book is The uh, Cosmic Jackpot, published in 2007. We have copies out there. And I, I have to say he's also written one or two uh, textbooks as well. One of them is Quantum Fields in Curved Space, which was reprinted four times the last time in 1994. Um, broadcaster and public lecturer. He's been on radio and TV from chat shows to various documentaries. Uh, I think one of the highlights would be a set of three documentaries he made on television in Australia. One of them was a six-part uh, TV series called The Big Questions. Uh, later, another one called more big questions. Was, the, the first one was quite popular. And still a third one called The Cradle of Life, which was about his work in astrobiology. Radio, he's, he's done the sort of, same sort of thing on radio. He produced, a, or not produced, but he, he uh, hosted a, a series of 45-minute productions on uh, 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 topics in modern physics. 
So one of them was called, for example, Desperately Seeking Super Strings. Another one called, <laughs> that one got an award, uh, Ge The Genesis Factor, and things like this that would really pull in an audience. Uh, he's been acknowledged for his work in promoting science to the public. Uh, in 2001, uh, he received the Kelvin Medal from the UK Institute of Physics for promoting science to the public. And in 2002, he received the Michael Faraday Prize from the Royal Society uh, for the same thing. Uh, he's received the Templeton Prize for progress in religion because of the interdisciplinary work he was doing trying to, to, to merge the concepts in religion with concepts in science. Uh, in 2007, he was uh, honored by getting the Order of Australia, which is kind of like Sir Paul Davies, but it's not quite Sir, but it's of the equivalent. And uh, he's also had recently an asteroid named after him. It's called Paul Davies, one word, lowercase. But uh, Paul Davies asteroid, here's Paul Davies himself giving our lecture today. Well, thank you, Bill, for that very generous uh, introduction. And you're one of the few Americans I've met that can correctly pronounce Macquarie. Uh, so um, can everybody hear me all right with this mic? It's working all right, because the, the microphone itself is almost invisible. I thought for a moment it had dropped off, but it's a tiny micro mic. Uh, anyway, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to, to be back here at NIST and uh, to tackle uh, yet a another topic. Could I just get you to switch off your cell phones in case you've forgotten to do that? Uh, all science proceeds on the basis that we live in a universe that's uh, ordered in an intelligible manner. And so before, ah, uh, there we are. Uh, before we do anything else, let me uh, get out of this one. Get into that one. Uh, this uh, early Islamic uh, uh, piece of artwork uh, shows that uh, for some hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, people have uh, understood that nature has uh, a hidden mathematical order. And this uh, culture of seeking an order in nature and giving it a mathematical description uh, was the predominant influence in Europe at the time that what we now call modern science, and in particular physics, uh, was founded by Galileo, Newton, and others. Now, Albert Einstein uh, was fond of saying that the question that really interested him was uh, something along the lines of whether the good Lord had any choice in the nature of his creation. It's uh, liberally translated from the, the German. What did he mean by that? Well, what he meant was, uh, could the universe have been otherwise? Could there have been different laws describing nature? Uh, and if it could have been otherwise, it naturally raises the question, uh, why do the laws have the form that they do? And is there anything special about the laws, or are they just any old laws that uh, you, you might make up as first thought? Is there anything distinctive about them? And that raises an interesting question, which is that, uh, if the laws could have been otherwise, uh, can we imagine a theory of laws? Can we imagine going beyond simply accepting the laws as given and coming up with some sort of explanation for why the laws are as they are? So these are weighty questions, but they're also somewhat heretical questions. And I think back to my student days in London in the 1960s, asking uh, where have the laws of physics come from or why do they have the form that they do, uh, simply got you into trouble. Uh, this, this is um, the orthodox view concerning the law. As physicists tend to use the, the, um, the laws of physics to mean the laws of nature, and when you're talking to other scientists, they think of the laws of nature as somewhat broader, uh, but I'll assume that the truly fundamental laws are basically the laws of physics, but sometimes I'll talk about the laws of nature. And so what you were uh, told in those days was um, and still are uh, uh, in, in many quarters these days, you're told that the laws exist for no reason. That is, that they have the form that they do, with it. there is no reason for, for that. They exist reasonlessly. 
um, you must accept them as a brute fact. And you see, I put on faith there in quotation marks. I wrote an article in New York, New York, New York Times a year or so ago on this subject, and the editor decided to uh, put the title of the article as um, uh, having faith in the laws of science, and that uh, caused all sorts of problems. Uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, but uh, I mean, what I mean by that is that we are told that we simply have to believe in the laws, that uh, we believe that the sun will come up tomorrow just as it's come up uh, for uh, every day so far. Uh, we, ha we have faith in that sense that, uh, that we live in a lawful universe. Uh, we can't uh, prove that it's going to be that way. As David Hume showed a long time ago, inductive reasoning is different from deductive reasoning. There's no logical reason the universe has to remain ordered. So we accept it as an article of faith, as a founding uh, point for doing science. So that's the, the sense in which I use it. Um, to talk about where have the laws come from, I, 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 we have always been told uh, that you can't do that, that the origin of the laws is beyond the scope of science. And so if you're asking, well, why do the laws have that particular form and not some other form, is not a scientific uh, question, we're told, and, and is to be strongly discouraged. And so when I was a student, I would ask these questions, and I was simply told, you know, sit down, Davis, shut up, and get on with your work. So the job of the physicist, it is said, is to accept the laws of physics on faith as given and work out their consequences, or alternatively to do experiments to discover what the laws might be, not to ask questions about where they've come from. And uh, this point of view, I think, still is the prevalent one, and it's uh, very nicely and lucidly summed up by Sean Carroll. He's a cosmologist uh, in California, um, and he says it very well. There's a chain of explanations concerning things that happen in the universe, which ultimately reaches to the fundamental laws of nature and stops. At the end of the day, the laws are what they are. That's okay. I'm happy to take the universe just as we find it. So I think his point of view sums up the orthodox position that you just accept the laws as given, as brute facts, and you don't inquire as to where they have come from. Uh, but the list of properties that these laws have is rather a long one. Uh, and because we're so steeped in the tradition of the scientific um, approach to studying nature, uh, we tend to take uh, these properties for granted. We, we don't even question them. Uh, we think it has to be this way. Uh, but uh, in, in fact, that list is rather long. So the first thing about the laws, I say circa 1965, I don't think it's changed much since, uh, is that these laws are immutable an absolute, that is, that they're not going to change, they're uh, fixed once and for all, uh, they're universal, the laws over there are the same as the laws over there, even on the edge of the universe and, and beyond. They're eternal, they don't change with time. Uh, they're infinitely precise. When we write down an equation, the superstring Lagrangian, or Einstein's equations, or Maxwell's equations, we don't assume that these equations are approximate, we assume that they are exact. Now, of course, we recognize that when you write down like something like Maxwell's equations, they may not be the last word on the subject. Uh, indeed, they're not. We know that quantum electrodynamics uh, overtakes them. But we assume that there's a final set of equations out there somewhere that would encapsulate the, the true set of fundamental laws, and that these would be infinitely precise. Uh, the laws are transcendent. Um, now, what do I mean by that? Most physicists, at least those that I talk to, believe that the laws of physics exist independently of the universe. Uh, in some sense, they were around before the universe. Uh, and I'll come on to that in a moment, exactly what that means. But uh, that's an important point. Um, and if you really uh, press cosmologists about the nature of the laws, they will say um, that these laws are imprinted on the universe at the moment of its birth at the Big Bang, imprinted, so to speak, from without, like the maker's mark, and you see the, the stamp there. Um, and that whatever happens in the universe, however violent the phenomena may be, the laws are oblivious to it. So the states of the world depend on the laws, but the laws themselves are quite independent of uh, what, what happens in the universe. Uh, and then the last point is that they are beyond the scope of science, they are given. So the question is that these are all 
tacit assumptions we make. We, we go, go about our business of doing physics without even thinking uh, about whether these assumptions are justified. And so what I'd like to do in this lecture is to critically examine all those founding assumptions. They're the founding assumptions of science as we know it. And, and say, well, um, can we justify them? And if we can't, uh, might, might some of them be wrong? Some of them should at least be questioned. Um, the, the point of view that theoretical physicists bring to bear uh, is best summarized by uh, a philosophy known as Platonism. Now, Plato uh, argued that mathematics has an existence which is uh, somehow independent of the physical universe, so that the statement 11 is a prime number, for example, is uh, it's not in the universe, it's uh, simply a true statement, and it's true whether there was a universe here or not. Uh, and most mathematicians think of mathematical relationships as existing in this platonic realm, which is a transcendent realm. It's not in the universe, it's sort of in its own abstract universe. Um, at least working mathematicians sometimes say they're Platonists on weekdays and anti-Platonists at weekends, or maybe the other way around. So they can't quite make up their minds. The alternative point of view, you see, is that mathematics is a, a free creation of the human mind. So it's a, it's a product of human thought, and it doesn't really exist. It doesn't have an independent existence. I think most mathematicians probably believe it does have an independent existence. And physicists took over that platonic view. Uh, the laws of physics we think of as mathematical relationships, and just as the mathematical relationships for Plato exist in this abstract transcendent realm, so the laws of physics uh, have that platonic property too. They exist, they're not in the universe, they exist somehow outside of the universe, and this slide says it all, uh, that we, um, the laws of physics are a subset, that's the wrong thing, I want the pointer. Where is the pointer on this? Is there a pointer? There is a pointer. But which thing do I press to get the pointer? I daren't press anything else in case it, that's, a, that's a better one. Let's go with that. Right, thank you. Um, so we think of um, the laws of physics as a subset of mathematics. So mathematics are like a wonderful warehouse of uh, different forms and, and relationships. And the laws of physics are just a subset that is taken from that. And the, the image that I like to have um, is that of, of Mother Nature with a, a shopping trolley going into this warehouse of mathematical forms and then taking out a few choice uh, items. Uh, you know, a symmetry group here and uh, uh, an equation there and so on, uh, and using those uh, to build a universe. And I've even got a slide that shows this. That's, uh... <laughs> Uh, and so, to, to just recap then, we think of the, the laws of physics as uh, a subset of platonic mathematical relationships which transcend the universe and were then imprinted upon the universe at the time of its birth. Now the other point which I've mentioned, but let me just uh, say again, uh, is the fact that the, the, ever since Newton, this is really the, one of the founding dualisms of uh, science as we know it, Ever since Newton, uh, the laws have been regarded as completely independent of the physical states of the world. So as I said earlier, that the, what happens in the universe depends on the laws, but the laws themselves are utterly impervious uh, to the physical states. So it's a curious asymmetry. So we've got this long list then, eternal, absolute, uh, transcendent, uh, independent of, uh, of the universe and so on, for the properties of these laws. Now, where have they, they come from, all these properties? Why do we have to have that approach to the nature of fundamental laws? Um, well, historically, uh, they, uh, the physics as we know it uh, grew out of the twin influences of uh, Greek philosophy, which stressed the notion that human beings could come to understand the world through the exercise of reasoning. That's not obvious. The world is very complicated. And most cultures never thought that you could get to the bottom of it, but the Greeks had this audacious idea that if we were just clever enough, we could figure it out. So that was the, the first uh, dominant influence in uh, Europe 
at the time that science was formed. And the other uh, was monotheism. Uh, and monotheism is characterized by the notion that uh, the universe was uh, created by a rational lawgiver who ordered it in an intelligible way. And so the early scientists like Galileo and Newton, uh, who were very religious, thought that in uncovering the, the laws of physics, as we would now call it, uh, they were, uh, as it were, glimpsing thoughts in the mind of God. And so the properties that Newton and his contemporaries brought to the laws of physics simply were the properties of the deity that they believed in. And it's a very particular sort of deity. It's not the deity of most of the planet. It's this monotheistic deity with a specific view of the nature of reality and the nature of time. Um, and uh, so here we see it, uh, that uh, they have this uh, idea that the universe is ordered by a rational lawgiver, uh, and this is imposed from without. And in case you doubt this, I've got a couple of uh, quotations that make it very explicit. The first is by Descartes, uh, who says quite explicitly, it is God who has established the laws of nature as a king establishes laws in his kingdom. You will be told that if God has established these truths, he could also change them as a king changes his laws. To which it must be replied, yes, if his will can change. But I understand them as eternal and immutable. I judge the same of God. So the et eternal, immutable nature of the laws springs directly from their divine origin. And Spinoza, um, the philosopher and theologian uh, whom Einstein felt he was uh, most closely attuned uh, with, uh, says something very similar around about the same time. Uh, now, as nothing is necessarily true save only by divine decree, it is plain that the universal laws of nature are decrees of God, following from the necessity and perfection of the divine nature. So nature, therefore, always observes laws and rules which involves eternal necessity and truth, although they may not be all known to us, and therefore she keeps a fixed and immutable order. So this idea that the laws can't change, they're fixed and they're universal, is because they spring from the divine nature of a God who is fixed and immutable and eternal. And we see uh, their obvious theological roots. This uh, particular view of the nature of physical law reached its pinnacle uh, with this famous quotation from Pierre Laplace. So uh, once Newton had written down a set of equations that described a deterministic uh, system, uh, then, uh, as you well know, given the initial conditions, uh, the consequences of those e equations can be worked out. And Laplace saw that if we could scale this up to the universe as a whole, uh, then uh, it would be possible, in principle, to predict everything that is going to happen and everything that ever has happened. So an, an intellect which at any given moment knew all of the forces that animate nature and the mutual positions of the beings that compose it, sort of quaint language, uh, if this intellect were fast, and this is an important point I'm going to come back to, if this intellect were vast enough to submit the data to analysis, could condense into a single formula the movement of the greatest bodies of the universe and that of the lightest atom. For such an intellect, nothing could be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So we have the idea of the universe as a perfect, predictable machine, springing from this notion of immutable, timeless, eternal laws. Now, after 300 years, it seems to me it's legitimate to challenge that orthodox view of the nature of science. Uh, it, uh, I've said already, and let me repeat it, um, we take it for granted in doing science that the laws are this way. We take on board this essential uh, 17th century theological position. Uh, it's a particular view of nature. It may be right, it may be wrong, uh, but we can certainly challenge it. It's not a view of nature shared by most cultures on this planet. It's not shared, for example, by Aboriginal Australians. Uh, it's not shared uh, by uh, the Hindu culture. It's not shared by uh, any other cultures, in fact, that don't uh, spring from either Judaism, Islam, or Christianity, which had a decisive break with the uh, uh, pagan and uh, other earlier cultures that sees nature as more organic and cyclic. That's a particular point of view. Anyway, it, we could certainly uh, question it, uh, and the things I would like to question are the infinite precision 
the immutability and the transcendent nature of those laws. Uh, can we justify uh, these uh, assumptions? Uh, so what I'd like to outline is an attempt to build what we might regard as a thoroughly rational uh, view of the universe by uh, attempting to bring the laws of nature within the scope of physics. Instead of saying they're off limits, you can't talk about the laws of nature, don't ask where they come from, it's not a scientific question. I've got to say, let's make it a scientific question. Let's see if we can come up with an explanation for the laws. Uh, so instead of accepting them as just uh, given, uh, we see if we can find some way of explaining them. And uh, part of the job there, therefore, is uh, by bringing the laws within the scope of science, is to bring them, as it were, within the universe and not just say they're imprinted on the universe from without by some magical mechanism. Uh, and again, as part of this, this uh, curious asymmetry that the laws can affect the states but the state can't, states can't affect the laws, seems to me we will never have a theory of laws uh, so long as we, uh, we uh, retain that dualism. So uh, this then is um, uh, an outline for a project of attempting to come up with a theory of the laws by relaxing some of those founding assumptions. Now, um, there's a bit of a culture uh, that um, supports this, uh, this point of view, and it comes about because, in spite of the fact that when I was a student, I was told you couldn't inquire where the laws had come from or why they had the form that they do, in recent years it's become quite fashionable, at least among my colleagues, uh, to stand back and, uh, and say, well, we could look at the possibility of the laws being different, and we could see what their consequences might be. And part of the reason for that comes from string theory, uh, which um, in its early days held out the promise of being a truly unifying system, a single mathematical scheme that would describe a unique universe. But it's become fairly clear, uh, not all string theorists agree with this, but fairly clear among most uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, that the theory at best describes a stupendous number of possible low energy worlds. And when I may mean low energy, I, I mean compared to the Planck energy. So even what we call high energy physics is still low energy by comparison. Uh, and so um, string theory describes, uh, according to one point of view, uh, a stupendous number, at least 10 to the 500, uh, possible low energy universes, uh, each with uh, its own set of laws. Uh, and so the laws of physics that we find in the textbooks we think of as being more like effective laws, valid at this relatively low energy, and not the truly fundamental laws out of which um, the universe is built. Uh, now, uh, um, one of the advocates of the notion of uh, many universes, many laws, is Martin Rees, uh, president of the Royal Society, and uh, now Lord Rees. Uh, and uh, his point of view is that we should think of the laws of physics as really like local bylaws. They're valid in our cosmic patch, but if we would tra travel sufficiently far over there or over there, we would come to another cosmic patch, another universe, if you like, uh, in which those laws might be different. Now, these cosmic patches uh, may be so large that the Hubble volume that we see could be deeply embedded within one. Uh, so we may see no sign of the laws uh, changing as we go to another patch, uh, but he believes that, um, that there, there would be this sort of cosmic domain structure uh, in which there would be different laws in different places. So this opens up the, the possibility that the laws could be different, and then of course uh, we would like to know why uh, we see the particular laws that we do see in our cosmic patch. Is it just random, uh, or is there some uh, reason why that particular set of laws uh, should be uh, observed. And um, first of all, but before getting to that reason, let me just say that, that this is a generic feature of any universe that starts out with a hot big bang and cools down, because if any features of the effective low energy laws come about as a result of symmetry breaks, as we believe they do, uh, then if these uh, symmetry breaks are random, uh, then we would expect them to break differently in different regions. We would expect to get a cosmic domain structure just on generic grounds. So it's not an unreasonable assumption that the low energy laws, at least, uh, should uh, have this diversity. Now, um, the reason, according to Rees, uh, of why 
we see the laws we do relates to the Goldilocks enigma, um, why the universe is just right for life. Uh, so this, uh, you're all familiar with the Goldilocks story, but it's an interesting thing. As I uh, go around the world talking about this subject, I find that in many countries they don't know what I'm talking about, uh, the, <laughs> the story of Goldilocks. Um, so in France, uh, you know, some people seem to know it and others don't. Uh, in Rom Romania, they know the story of Goldilocks, but they call her something else, Dracula or something. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's very, very curious. In, I was in China a couple of weeks ago. They had no idea. So I was told, don't, whatever you do, to talk about Goldilocks. They won't know what you're talking about. But I think here you'll understand um, that uh, one of the features of um, uh, the universe, which uh, we would like to explain, is why it is suited for life. And it's uh, clear that if you could um, uh, play God and change the nature of the laws, uh, then uh, you don't have to change them by very much to preclude the existence of life. So, for example, if you imagine making the mass of the electron a little bit bigger, or the strength of uh, gravity a little bit uh, smaller, and so on, um, uh, there are about 30-something undetermined parameters in the standard model of particle physics and uh, cosmology. And we don't know those parameters are all independent. They may be linked one day, uh, but at the moment,